we've seen how modern economic growth burst forward in England in the middle of the 18th century. We've seen how subsequent waves of technological change, starting first with the steam engine and reaching us today with the information and communications technology revolution, have kept that process of endogenous economic growth continuing now for well over two centuries. But we've also noted that economic growth has another crucial dimension. For most of the world, not at the technological forefront, and not really contributing uh, in a major way to technological advances, economic growth is heavily about catching up. Uh, it is about uh, how a country that sees others in the lead can say, I want to use that technology too. Uh, we need uh, information technology in our society. Uh, we need to uh, use the best of uh, modern transport technology and the like. This is a process of catching up growth. Uh, it might be called uh, a process of diffusion if looked at from the outside. Because diffusion means that something spreads from one place to the next. Uh, I like to think of it uh, as uh, starting with a still pond or a quiet lake. Uh, you throw uh, the, uh, the rock into the middle of the lake and then you watch the ripples rippling away from uh, that center. And if the center is where the uh, endogenous technological leadership growth is taking place, those ripples signify the spread of those technologies and the modern economic growth that goes along with them to more and more of the world. How does that ripple effect work? Uh, what makes the ripples move forward? Why is it that some places in the world seem uh, to be very well poised to follow a, a, a technology leader pretty close at hand, whereas other parts of the world seemingly have not been able to take advantage of technologies that are already uh, more than a century old? It's striking to me, very troubling. Perhaps uh, one billion people, uh, some estimates have it at even twice that level, do not have access to electricity in the 21st century, where this is a technology developed by Edison and Westinghouse uh, already at the end of the 19th century. What stopped the ripples from reaching those places that still today don't have electricity bringing them the benefits of modern technology and modern life? That really is our question, uh, and it is one that uh, great economists have been thinking about for a long time. Adam Smith, way back in The Wealth of Nations, uh, in that magnificent work uh, about uh, the modern economy, talked about the fact that diffusion, the spread of technology, would take time, and that it would start at the coast, typically, and move to the interior. Why at the coast? Because conditions for trade, for market activity are easier. Why a long time to move to the interior? Because it's very difficult to engage in trade in the interior of a country or in the interior of a continent uh, in a landlocked country. Let me quote from Book One of The Wealth of Nations, 1776, because its insights continue to inform uh, and inspire us till today. So Adam Smith says, since such therefore are the advantages of water carriage, it is natural that the first improvements of art and industry should be made where this conveniency opens the whole world for a market to the produce of every sort of labor, and that they should always be much later in extending themselves into the inland parts of the country. So Smith already says in 1776, economic development is going to start at the coasts. It's going to spread into the interior. We know today, more than 200 years later, that landlocked countries of the world, countries like Bolivia in South America, uh, Chad in Niger uh, in Africa, Nepal in Asia, are 
necessarily facing disadvantages in trade, transport, and technological advance by virtue of them being far from the ports and facing very, very high costs of trade. Well, we can go beyond that insight to a general set of insights of factors that are conducive to the move of those ripples from the center of the Industrial Revolution out to the rest of the world. I would start, again, with proximity to markets. The coast is one part, because if you have a port, you are in a way proximate or close to, in economic terms, other ports around the world. Clearly, if you are close to a rich country, that also means that there's a big market for you. Mexico has a big market to sell to in its next door neighbor, the United States. And in the 19th century, countries that were close to Great Britain had an advantage for their own economic development of a booming economy that would provide a market for their own goods. So proximity to markets, that's one condition. Good agriculture, definitely an important fact because after all, most of the modern economy grows in cities, in uh, industry and in services. So you say, why do I emphasize agriculture? Because if agriculture is miserable, you may not have cities to speak of because there may be no food surplus. Countries with very weak agriculture are often exactly those places where most of the population is in farming eking out a living because they can't produce enough surplus even for themselves and their families, much less to feed big urban areas. As agriculture improves, a diminishing share of the population can feed the rest of the country and therefore support larger cities, which can then be hubs for technological advance and catching up. So good agriculture is important for vibrant cities. And therefore, places with good agricultural potential have tended to have those ripples arrive there faster than places in very dry conditions or poor soils or other impediments to agriculture. Third obvious point is places that have their own energy resources, be it coal, oil and gas, uh, other resources, hydro electric power and so forth, have an advantage. It's always possible to export goods and import your primary energy needs, but how are you going to export if you don't have energy to produce those export goods? So there's often a problem of even getting started in economic development. Regions that have their home-based primary energy resources, whether it's the fossil fuels of coal, oil, and gas, or whether it is uh, resources like wind energy, uh, or geothermal energy, uh, or solar energy. This is very important as a base for domestic production. It makes it possible for those ripples not just to hit uh, a hard wall, but to actually continue and generate economic change. And so the domestic energy base is extremely important. A Physical environment conducive to human health, also important. A disease-ridden environment filled with malaria, filled with worm infections, terrible conditions that afflict uh, many places uh, in the tropics till today can be real barriers, uh, real impediments to the diffusion of economic growth. And finally is politics. If the politics are miserable, uh, if dictators or simply chaos and violence uh, grip a society, this makes it very hard to achieve economic growth. Even if the ripples are coming one's way, uh, there's going to be no ability to harness those advantages uh, in a political environment that is devastating. Well, we can now look very practically at how to apply those insights in understanding the actual uh, ripples that uh, have spread over the world economy since the Industrial Revolution. And I have found it 
interesting and worthwhile to ask the question, when does an economy first pass a certain threshold out of basic poverty? If we use a certain uh, line roughly of about $2,000 per person measured in purchasing power adjusted terms, in other words, adjusting for difference of price levels, ask when is it that countries first escaped from extreme poverty by reaching that threshold or above, we can learn a lot. Which is the first country to do it? Well, it's Great Britain, the United Kingdom, the home of the Industrial Revolution. Then those ripples start to spread. And by now, they've reached most of the world. If we look just within Western Europe, it's quite fascinating because it really looks like ripples uh, spreading out from the home of the Industrial Revolution itself in England, out through the neighboring countries, uh, the Netherlands, uh, right across the sea from England, and then spreading into Belgium and France, uh, spreading next to, into Germany, spreading a bit farther uh, into Scandinavia and Spain, a bit later uh, into Central Europe, into uh, what was then the Habsburg Empire, and now is the Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, and Hungary uh, and uh, other parts uh, of Central Europe, and then spreading after that into Eastern Europe, Romania, Bulgaria, Russia, and uh, other countries uh, further to the east. So what we see is within Europe itself in the 19th century, that ripple effect very clear. It starts uh, where the stone hits first, where James Watt and his steam engine revolutionize uh, the, the modern world. Uh, and then you have a diffusion of modern economic growth uh, that is well dated to distance from England itself. The more proximate England, the faster the diffusion of technologies, the faster is the uptake of modern economic growth. But since Europe itself is relatively compact by the end of the 19th century, virtually all of Europe is on a path of industrial economic development. For the world, it's obviously a much different story. Uh, the ripples have to travel much longer distances, face far more complex uh, conditions, uh, and uh, have uh, hit barriers uh, that have uh, dissipated that energy uh, and have frustrated the takeoff of modern economic growth, uh, often for decades and in some cases till now. And you have the takeoff in what some historians call the land of new settlements, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. They are early industrializers. Uh, they are early to cross the thresholds out of extreme poverty. The next group of countries are countries that share a favorable natural environment. Generally, they are in the climate zones that we call temperate zones, like England, Four Seasons, Good Rains Around the Year, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile are examples of countries where the escape from poverty is already underway in the 19th century. In Asia, there's only one case of industrial takeoff by the end of the 19th century, and that's Japan. Take a look at the map. The place of Japan on the map is fairly analogous to the location of Great Britain. Off the great Eurasian landmass, of course, uh, Great Britain on the west of the Eurasian landmass and Japan on the east of the Eurasian landmass. Two island economies, two temperate zone climates, uh, two places where the conditions uh, of uh, social life, literacy rates, uh, freedom from uh, invasion uh, by sea enabled them to have takeoff conditions in Japan becomes the takeoff site for uh, Asia uh, with uh, its burst forward into industrialization beginning in 1868, the so-called Meiji Restoration. Much of the rest of the world, no such luck until the second half of the 20th century. Because what happened in a lot of the rest of the world? No independence, no sovereignty. In fact, conquest. Europe becomes so powerful, 
that European empires conquer large parts of the tropical world. By the end of the 19th century, virtually all of Africa is under European colonial rule. India has succumbed to British conquest. Much of Asia has succumbed to French and British conquest. And those countries do not pass the threshold out of extreme poverty. The ripples don't reach them. The imperial powers want to maximize their own well-being at home, their own industrialization. They view their colonies by and large as places for primary resources, for low-skilled labor, not as places for industrial development. And so a lot of the rest of the world does not see modern economic growth until after World War II and the process of decolonization. This is a crucial historic period that we're going to look at next.